Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are on this pandemic planet. It's, it's a fast forward planet. Uh, sadly, we're dealing with this pandemic longer than we might have if uh, there had been more of a uniform approach to uh, stop swapping air. But in the United States, we live in a country with very variegated approaches and views. And uh, that's got its, there are big detriments to that when it comes to public health. And we're seeing that play out in new surges of the disease. I'm Andy Revkin at Columbia University's Earth Institute, where I'm building an initiative on communication and sustainability. Uh, of course, I'm in the Hudson Valley, uh, not at the Earth Institute. I haven't been back there since March. Uh, today's discussion is going to center on something that's at the heart of what I talk about on this show with many guests. Uh, the show is about what do you do when you face complexity and consequence at the same time, whether it's around climate change, whether it's around the pandemic. Uh, we've done shows just literally on the infodemic around the pandemic, whether it's we're going to be talking about emerging technologies uh, on the show. And this this session is on now that there are vaccines starting to flow, uh, along with the, the near-term picture, there's there's this fight over vaccine hesitance versus vaccine confidence and whether people are going to ad adequately buy into to getting the shot. But on a broader scale, I've seen this all around me now. Everyone's just chomping at the bit to get back to normal, right? So there's a vaccine, so now we go back. And uh, I've written about other risks like this uh, where one of the dangers is taking your uh, taking our eyes societally off of the bigger picture. What are we not doing, or, or are we going to go to sleep again on the, the big challenge of whether it's decarbonization for climate and here, whether it's de-pandemicization of the world? Can we really fundamentally, systematically reduce risk of emerging disease becoming a jolts like the one we've faced? Uh, today, we're going to talk about this with some fantastic guests here. I'm going to maximize the view so you can meet them all face to face. Uh, Jonathan Salk, who's... Uh, Best known, you know, we don't all want to be defined by our fathers. But Jonathan <laughs> is a psychiatrist. He has a long, uh, he's been a student of sustainability questions. Uh, and he happened to be a co-author with his father of a book, uh, A New Reality, that is um, has re been re-emerged, re-published. And there, uh, Roman Krasnarek is holding up a copy of Jonathan's book. I have enjoyed my copy as well. And it's about, you know, we think of Jonas Salk and the polio vaccine as a champion who wrote, wrote in pioneered vaccine production at a time when I, I was talking to some elders about polio. Anyone who lived through, the, through that time knows it was incredibly scary. No one knew or they didn't know it was a virus. People were avoiding each other. There was terrible fear about uh, uh, this, this mystery. And along comes this innovative scientist. And uh, we got that right. But the book makes the point, of course, that it's not just about the vaccine. As you can see, I love this, this juncture uh, image, which I think Tara and Roman, and I certainly appreciate, and Erwin Redliner, who'll be on in a minute, will appreciate as well, which shows that you could look at where we are as uh, the Zoom part, meaning we've been on, literally scientists call this the great acceleration for the last 50 or 100 years, the Anthropocene, which I've dug in on, and you could say, oh my God, they are just gonna crash and burn. Uh, but Jonas and Jonathan and others, Roman has embraced this too, have the sense it's more like a transition. You could almost call it an organic possibility of moving to a more measured uh, journey for our species. Uh, and that's the big question. What is that? I added the arrow, we are here. <laughs> so <laughs> we are here. Uh, so that's, that's uh, Jonathan's work. Um, uh, Tara O'Toole is a uh, has a is an MD, um, background in public health, but she's also deeply dug in on uh, an arena that's vital to this question of where we go from here, which is the technology technologies related to how we advance, um, how we keep track of threats. Uh, she is part of what's called NQTEL, which is, she's the executive vice president of NQTEL which is uh, essentially a venture capital firm looking to stimulate and accelerate progress on technologies and capacities that can help us essentially 
navigate that that juncture in our curve or, or modulate it actually. You know, what can we do to avoid the next pandemic, to avoid bioterrorism, to avoid an intelligence failure like what happened on 9-11? And again, more than that could be coming. And finally, uh, Roman Krishna, why do I always stumble over your name? I shouldn't. It's so simple. You get, you get it right at least 50% of the time. So there Krishnarek. you go. Roman Krasnarek, who is a public philosopher, one of my favorite titles, uh, and has written a book called uh, The Good Ancestor, which is about this question of what do we owe the future? Yeah, I like that, how you're each holding up each other's book. I was going on your, your website, uh, romankersnarek.com, uh, and there's this reminder uh, again of our juncture on this planet the dead are only about 100 billion humans so far the living are 7.7 7 billion and untold trillions yet to come if we don't screw up that transition <laughs> too badly and, and i you know i've had other people i've talked to from uh, who study these 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 longer time scale transitions and there there are definitely pathways toward a prosperous future with a few billion people on a planet with equity and with plenty of room for nature and but how do we do that so it, it involves technology it involves tara it involves philosophy and ethics it involves values and it involves other routes to science it's great to have you all here today and i just briefly want to also add here my friend and colleague uh, erwin redlet erwin redliner who was the founding director of the national center for disaster preparedness which is part of the earth institute at columbia university where i work and Erwin uh, is always on the run. He's not driving, <laughs> but he's in a car. Yes, there we go, proof. And it's great to have you back, Erwin. The last time you were on the show, you were also in a car. So there's a lot to go over here, and I uh, thank you for uh, tolerating the introduction, everyone. Uh, but I did want to give Erwin the floor briefly to talk about the state of the uh, pandemic right now, because one of the things that we clearly need to figure out is how to stop swapping air as a, a new Mike Osterholm uh, campaign is putting it. Whether you make this message about masks or the like, the thing you have to stop is that. So Erwin, you know, we're not doing very well, it seems, in the United States. Oh, you're muted. Hold on, I have to unmute you, sorry. One second. Unmute, Mike. Oh, maybe you have to do I it. have to, hang on. There we, there we go. go, okay. Okay, so I'm um, happy to, to uh, join the conversation with these uh, great panel. I've known Tara for many, many years. And, uh, uh, and I, you know, I, before I get started, though, I, I just want to comment about your, your comments about the future and the, your uh, various panelists who've been thinking about that in various ways. But so I, I just put out a revised, I mean, an updated version of a book I wrote in 2017 called The Future of Us, What the Dreams of Children Mean for 21st Century America. And Really, uh, the premise of the book is that uh, there are too many children who have really almost zero pathways to becoming successful in life. And uh, that is a serious problem, obviously, for those children who are facing tremendous adversity, but also for the future of society in the country. We can't have millions and millions of people growing up needing remediation and trying to fix uh, damage that was done early in childhood. So I, I, I would just propose that we don't really have a successful future for society if we don't pay attention to children, not only those here in the U.S. facing adversities, but, you know, the 65 million uh, uh, international refugees and displaced persons, among which are, you know, probably 30 or 40 million children. So this is a real international problem, which is that without a glide path for the future of all children, we are in really deep trouble. I don't care what technology has to say. We need human beings to be functional and not be burdened by stuff that we sh really should have avoided. But so um, the, uh, the comments about uh, where we are with the pandemic, this is it's just it's not good. I don't want to we're not going to go backwards. I just want to say something about the state of things right now. I never expected that we would break 3000 fatalities in a single day, which we just have in the last couple of days which of course, as people have been pointing out, is more than the number of Americans uh, lost on the first day of the Normandy invasion uh, in World War II. It's uh, more than uh, we lost on 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers are absolutely staggering. 
And uh, as a pandemic, that means it's a, this is a ubiquitous problem. It is uh, obviously global, but it's uh, as far as where it is and how it's how it's behaving uh, in the U.S. and I guess elsewhere. But let's say in the U.S., this is like a gigantic lethal game of whack-a-mole where, uh, you know, we have uh, outbreaks and surges in some place in the country that gets uh, under control. And then we see uh, serious outbreaks in other parts of the country. And. Uh, we don't have like, you know, with seasonal flu, which can kill also 25,000 more people in a year, we at least have something if you go to the doctor and you have signs of the flu and you can document that you have the flu, you might get a prescription for Tamiflu, uh, which might uh, really mitigate the more serious symptoms or even prevent uh, further advance of the influenza. We don't have a medication like that now. All we have are the NPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, like, uh, like, uh, keeping our distance from people, wearing uh, face masks, especially indoors, and doing what Osterholm has been saying. It's just whatever we, whatever it takes to keep us from sharing air with other people in close proximity, that's what we need to do. So it, in some ways, it's it's a little, you know, it, it's a little primitive in a sense, and I, I don't blame people for thinking, is that, is that all we have, uh, at least until we get the vaccines functional? And it, it's true, it's more or less like what we had in 1918 with the uh, with the Spanish flu, and there was some pretty sophisticated public health efforts going on then. Uh, but uh, right now, we are struggling to make sure that everybody's on board with these NPIs. It's really, it's it's incredible. A combination of social media and uh, Donald Trump have created this uh, horrible, toxic mix of uh, enhancing vaccine resistance. Uh, or hesitancy, at least, and that's going to be a problem. And the final thing, I just want to talk a little bit about the vaccine status. And there's no denying, it was, it's extraordinarily good news that we have uh, vaccines now ready. You know, the, uh, the appropriate advisory committees of the FDA voted yesterday uh, to go ahead with the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna should come shortly. We may be seeing something else from AstraZeneca and then Johnson & Johnson. So we're getting, we have in the pipeline. Uh, the question is, what are the expectations about vaccine? And I think this is really important for people to understand. I spoke with uh, Dr. Fauci a couple of weeks ago, and I said, so what do you think? If I get a, and I'm pretty high risk myself, but if I get a vaccine, any of the vaccines that are good, you know, uh, shown to be efficacious and then have positive serology a month later, am I good to go? And he said, no, I was going to put that message forward, but he, he, he said no. And one of the reasons is that we don't actually know what the vaccine does. It probably, and when we talk about the 90 or 95 percent efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine, it's not clear exactly what they're talking about, but it seems to be uh, the ability for the vaccine to prevent one from getting very sick. That's what the data seems to say, as opposed to establishing some sort of proof that it actually will prevent you getting infected. And I think that that distinction is being um, clarified uh, as we speak here. But the second thing is that uh, I we have to avoid too much happy talk about how easy it's going to be to distribute the vaccine and administer it to people. You know, we need uh, absolutely frigid temperature control for the Pfizer vaccine, less so for Moderna's. But there's plenty of parts of the country where that cold chain reality is not feasible, just not going to happen. Originally, we were talking about in, before the end of this month, being able to vaccinate uh, 20 million people. That's not actually true. It's more like 12 to 15 million people if things go well. And also Pfizer's reported some production challenges that may have less doses available. So I think that as sort of a, a thumbnail, uh, I would just conclude by saying the situation is out of control. It's a deadly Uh, reality that we're facing. And the United States has a huge uh, percentage of the actual active problems and fatalities and so on. So we have a lot to be working on, Andy. That's for sure. T Tara, uh, and Roman and Jonathan, I hope you, you're okay waiting a minute. Uh, Tara, you've worked at this um, in this arena of vaccine pre preparedness, I guess I'd call it. And when you think about where we're at, with the vaccines that are starting to roll out and what would be needed to have the capacity to swiftly move forward as other threats emerge. 
what's uh, the highest uh, ideas in your mind? What's the priorities for you? Well, <clears throat> um, I am really more optimistic than um, Irwin, but I am uh, on this subject. Um, first, I think we have to recognize that to have 200 vaccines or more, there's so many under development, it's hard to count them. At this point, one year after the initiation of a major pandemic, um, is an extraordinary feat of scientific creativity and genius combined with um, government assistance. I mean, we would not have these vaccines had governments and not just the US government, had they not leaned in and agreed to pay for vaccines, whether or not they worked, which gave um, pharma companies, big pharma companies, as well as tiny little innovative companies, uh, the opportunity to go to work. Um, both the Moderna vaccine um, and um, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, um, as well as the AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccines are very new technologies. And those new technologies are what permitted us to make these vaccines so rapidly. Um, and hopefully to manufacture them at scale very, very quickly. So that's the first thing that this is, I think, uh, when we look back on uh, that chart that you showed at the beginning, this is going to be one of the inflection points. And it's not just about vaccines. It's about our capacity to understand how biological systems work, including viruses, and to manipulate them in ways um, that um, allow us to make new products more sustainably, allow us to sustain whole ecosystems more intelligently, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that um, Irwin is right. We now have to manufacture billions of doses of these vaccines, which will be a huge feat. Um, but as we reference World War II in terms of casualties, we have the capacity in the world now to rapidly scale up the manufacturing um, of these vaccines. Um, what I am most worried about um, is the willingness of people to take the vaccine um, to recognize that it's not just a matter of not swapping air, it's a matter of getting vaccinated oneself in order to protect others. Right. Um, and I think that's going to be a hard message to get through. But um, unfortunately, yeah. tragically, as the deaths mount up, um, the persuasiveness of vaccines, I think, will also go up. That point you just raised about uh, the common good, essentially, that part of us that's communitarian. It leads very well to the work of Roman and the work of Jonathan in the sense that um, that's the part of us that's or about someone else in the future is like the most vivid someone else that's there. So they're not there yet. So uh, Roman, what do you think about when you, you know, we know as, 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 as Tyra just explained, the technologies are amazing right now. And uh, earlier this year, you gave a presentation, Tara, including discussing how CRISPR and other genetic manipulation can further uh, make us more agile and responsive and reactive. But what, do we need the same kind of capacity? Do we need to invent new ways to think about communitarianism so we have that to match the technology? That's a very interesting way of putting it, actually, because I guess the suggestion there is that innovation can come in the realm of values as well as the realm of CRISPR and other stuff like that. And of course, these things are so intimately related. I mean, I was in a meeting uh, just a couple of weeks ago with various um, UK government departments discussing the government's uh, policies or lack of policies around synthetic biology and you know, forms of regulation and so on. And of course, once you start thinking about what the regulatory environment should look like and so on, you hit up against big questions of values, like, well, what are these technologies for? If you're looking at the big question of purpose, you know, do we want to use engineered biology to 
invent new kinds of perfume and create designer babies or help solve the climate crisis or deal with cancers and, and things like that. And, you know, these are massive questions, of course, about values or who gets to own the technology, the balance between private and, and, and public and, and those kinds of things. Um, but I do think that there is a kind of innovation that we do need around values. And this really goes back to that diagram you showed at the beginning that uh, Jonathan uh, and his father Jonas, you know, developed about the shift from Epoch A to Epoch B, as they called it, the shift from things like uh, individualism to interdependence, to short from short range thinking to long range thinking, to I, you know, an obsession with growth, 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 rather than ideas about thriving in balance. And I guess when I first saw that diagram, um, I found it really shocking um, because. Yes, there's a very positive I thought that we maybe were at an inflection point and in shifting from epoch A to epoch B, where there is a rise of, you know, ideas of, you know, collective ideals and, and new forms of economic governance, ideas of a well-being economy or circular economies, donut economies, all these mm -hmm. kinds of things. But when we when I look at that diagram, uh, the reason it frightens me <laughs> is because I realize that most of our institutions um, our political institutions, representative democracy, nation states, consumer capitalism, capitalism developed in the 18th and 19th century uh, and 20th century in epoch A, you know, when the world was very different, when populations were lower, there was less globalization and interdependence. And now we're in a different world. And those institutions are not designed for this world, right? Um, right. Rep, rep, the sort of short term electoral cycles are not designed for a world where you need to do long term planning for the next pandemic on the horizon for regulating AI, for dealing with biodiversity loss, for dealing with even deep racial injustice that gets passed on from generation to generation. So indeed, we actually need a kind of innovation um, of values to help us make that leap onto the next part of the S curve. Um, right. And I think not fall into the kind of Stephen Pinkeresque um, dream that the the you know the curve can go ever upwards and that, you know, technology will save us totally. I mean, I believe in the power of technology, but I think without that shift in values alongside it and without understanding what our goals are, we're not really going to solve the fundamental long-term problems of our century, ranging from the public health care ones to racial injustice, technology control, all those different kinds of uh, different kinds of things. So yes, I'm all for innovation. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, of course. This other book by Jonas Selk, Anatomy of Reality, which I don't think that many people have yeah. read, actually tries to answer this question, really. It talks about metabiological evolution or cultural evolution. How can we kind of consciously um, shift the values in society? Uh, so I recommend that. That's interesting. Uh, we'll have to get back to that book sometime. Uh, so that's a good lead into Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Salk, uh, you know, with your background in psychiatry as well, uh, thinking about that question, whether you call it innovation or new capacities, for us to understand we're all interconnected. Uh, I do think, I used to write about this um, when I read about Darwin way back in 1871. I had it here somewhere and maybe I'll read it. In, in The Descent of Man, he said, only an, only an artificial barrier uh, limits us in our moving from a uh, tribal nature, divided, you know, all about our own culture, our own people, to being a true global society. And this is Darwin in 1871. And I, you know, and of course, I think we have now technologies that are linking us and, and allowing us to connect, uh, at least those who are digitally connected, in ways that might change or might enable the the values to sort of emerge. But Jonathan, you know, what's your main thought in thinking about that innovation part of this? Is it just reading your book, or is it something bigger that has to happen? Well, and, um... It, it, in a sense, it starts with reading the book, but it, it, it does actually go much farther than that. Um, and, and I think Roman touches on a, on a lot of the issues. But what is needed, actually, and I think this is runs so strongly, is we need the innovations in technology. But as Tara was saying or implying, the improvements in technology themselves do not take care of what we need to take care of that we need innovation in the, in the realm of values and the realm of social and political systems. 
And um, this transition is so huge that it touches really literally every part of our human existence from almost our, our biological composition, our molecular compositions, all the way through how children are, are raised, all the way through family, community, work arrangements, but then going into something that Roman has, has addressed, which is um, we, we need, and he's addressed so, so well, we need very different social systems. We need very different political systems and economic systems in order to make this transition. And it's very much sort of a complex systems dynamic in that we need changes on the individual level so that they can fit into those systems. And we need changes in the system so that the individuals can, um, you know, can, can live and, and thrive in those ways. So the, the whole issue of innovation, you know, and on the optimistic side, this is a tremendously exciting time. It's a tremendous opportunity um, for human creativity and for, for our human ability to 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 innovate and to and to come into something new. So um, it's it's a time fraught with terrible danger, as as everyone's alluded to, and we may not make it. But if we are to make it, and if we can make it, it's it's actually pretty exciting. Tara, that's a good way time to pivot back to you. Um, at the Vatican in 2014, I was at this meeting on sustainable humanity. It was basically what. It was sustainable nature, sustainable humanity, our responsibility. That was the, the focus of this week-long meeting. And there was this um, cardinal, Mara Diaga, who kicked off the meeting by saying, nowadays man seems to be a technical giant and an ethical child. <laughs> and you know, I think about CRISPR, which I think is an incredibly powerful tool for, for the world. Um, I know it's gonna be abused in the way it's portrayed, I know there, we, I'm a techno optimist by nature, but I know there's value to precaution. So when you think about these questions of national security and technology and the capacities, that's every one of them cuts in both directions. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like we're lagging on the values aspect of it? All powerful technologies since the beginning of time have been dual use. Okay, they've got a dark side to them, all of them from um, you know, steam power uh, through coal power, as we're now seeing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, electricity caused us to dam up most of the rivers in the United States, for example, with terrible consequences ecologically. So um, that's a given. Um, my favorite definition of technology is one um, uh, provided by Brian Arthur, who's actually an economist but he watched the Silicon Valley phenom uh, emerge and was surprised that he could find so little written about technology itself and what it is. And his definition was that technology comes from harnessing an understanding of natural phenomena to human purpose. And we have become profoundly more knowledgeable about human, about natural phenomena, whether we're talking about cells or uh, supernovas. Um, we have become much less sophisticated about what our human purposes ought to be. And in the last century in particular, as you said, Andy, we've been driven by the economics, by the uh, material uh, production and consumption of stuff. And I think that is um, something that has to change. I would not be surprised if this pandemic didn't shift that focus considerably. Um, you know, in spite of everybody using Amazon to get everything under the sun, um, I think people are learning in this weird lockdown world that you need less stuff. And what really matters is being able to go for a walk outside, being able to watch birds outside your window and being able to see each other. Um, so um, I think technology is what, I think technology is essential to getting us through this era. Um, I think we live in an age of epidemics, which is not going to end with COVID-19 being quenched and is a direct result of our intrusion into animal ecosystems. 
um, particularly changes in land use due to agriculture and commercialization. Um, there's a lot of other things that this age characterizes or is characterized by that I think need to shift to get on your upper curve. Um, but we're not going to be able to do it without technology. I mean, one example is agriculture. If we're going to feed everybody on the planet under climate change conditions, we need technology to do that, particularly actually CRISPR. Um, and that is probably currently the most um, intense use of CRISPR is to try and create plants that can sustain drought and hot um, climates and new bugs coming at them, et cetera, et cetera. So I think technology is dangerous. I think it's quite wondrous. I think we're not very good at using it wisely, but I think it's the way through to a great extent. It's not the whole story as Jonathan said, but it is essential. And if we freak out about technology and don't use it to the extent that we could and as wisely as we could, we're going to be in real trouble. So, Jonathan, I'd like to go back to your dad's work. Um, could you characterize from your memory and what you've learned, you know, not just from your own memory, the mix of qualities that he had when he was approaching the polio crisis? Um, yeah, sure. There's a lot to say on, on this subject because because he he was a remarkable person, a remarkable human being. But I think starting with the polio vaccine, one of the things is that um, uh, one of his one of his mentors at, at that time, period of time, and he was a young man, met him and said, "I finally found a scientist who thinks outside the laboratory." Um, and he really had a sense of purpose about the vaccine, and he understood what this meant for human beings. He was not just solely focused on the technology, but on the on the, the melding of that. And then what was remarkable, Andy, is that he then went on and after the vaccine, which came out when he was 40, um, and he had the whole rest of his life to live, um, he had the concept of putting together an institute where people would, um, work on, um, sorry, I was just looking at the pictures, <laughs> um, where people, where, where scientists and humanists could come together and work together to solve mankind's problems. Um, but he really saw that as the, as the, the melding of, of, of those two. And then the thinking that went into our book and the thinking that went into his, his own books was an extension of that. And he really had this concept of, of using biological approaches to social problems, not just through technology, but he really talked about this phenomenon that he called metabiology, um, which was really our social and our physical and our spiritual beings, and um, and and how how that is changing at the same time. And, and but the the so there were a lot of things, but but he really did managed to step outside the laboratory and bring in the humanistic aspect to it. And that was really his dream was to be able to do that. Well, what you just described in that mix of human humanism and technology in the same place, that feels a lot like the kind of mix we need going forward, um, whether it's um, how technologies are assessed. There used to be an Office of Technology Assessment for Congress. That mm -hmm. went away. Um, It'd be nice if that came back. But re uh, recently, um, I did a s webcast on here with a former uh, presidential science advisor, Neil Lane, about how does a president facing a complex and consequential landscape make decisions? How do you incorporate science advice? And one of his key points was, uh, he wrote about this in Nature in a commentary, was uh, the, the science advice has to be at the table with the cabinet. Because it's not just the advice. It's not like writing a report, putting it on a president's desk. It's the dynamics of those conversations. It's the uh -huh. human relationships in a cabinet that end up potentially reverberating and creating new directionality. I, I assume, Tara, you've been in that universe of uh, intelligence advice and the like. And does that resonate too? You know, it's not just like someone popping into an office and saying, this is what we know. Yeah, that, that's true. Actually, I worked at the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment um, oh, before 
before uh, Newt Gingrich eliminated it. And one of its secret sauces was that it was bipartisan and no report got started unless both the chairman of the committee that was asking for the report and the ranking member from the other side of the aisle requested the report. Um, that was a great organization. And I agree with you, Andy, I wish we'd bring it back. Um, you know, when, and in fact, uh, my boss at OTA, Jack Gibbons, became the president science advisor in the Clinton administration. And at his going away party, um, President Clinton showed up and he said, you know, when I first became president, I figured that maybe 10% of the time I'd need advice from the scientists. And he said, it turns out you need the scientist all the time and everything. And that's become even more true in government. Um, it's very hard to integrate it into these old institutions that we've got, as you said at the outset. Um, and one of the things we're gonna need to get to the next epic is many, many more scientists agreeing to work in government. Mm -hmm. We have hollowed out the technical expertise of our government, not just in this past administration, it's been going on for over 25 years because we've been very unsuccessful and haven't paid attention, frankly, to recruiting young people with technical backgrounds into these public service positions. And that's one of the big things that has to change. If we could get a real dollop of eager young people who are fluent in any of a number of technical fields into government, that would start to change things. I agree. There is this little micro enterprise in New York City. Uh, it was a woman, Nancy Holt, who used to be um, a AAAS fellow. AAAS, the science organization, used to place scientists in positions as young scientists working in the congressional office and the like. And a lot of those people move forward in ways that have been very valuable to um, policy. Uh, but sci now she's here in New York City creating science for New York, which is a way to engage uh, New York-based scientists, they could be young, they don't have to be tenured, tenured or whatever. And everything as simple as going to a city council meeting or your borough meetings, just kind of understand the ecology of social change and polit politics. And I feel that more of that would be a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Uh, Irwin is back with us and thank you, Irwin. It looks like you're out of the car, um, which is great. Um, and Irwin, you know, with your focus on youth too, I, I think, there's a great opportunity or great loss in right at this moment in how we enable youth everywhere to become sort of lifelong learners, but from the start, inquiry-based learning, getting at this problem of the pandemic in a way that allows them to unleash their intellectual curiosity seems like a important way forward. We'll find out. Or when you're, you're muted, if you wanna come in. I don't think I muted. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think this this idea of uh, looking at the future from the point of view, of course, of technology and being able to solve problems much more fluidly than we have been, and especially things like uh, that I think might come out of this whole episode with the pandemic is a far greater appreciation for not only what Tara was saying, but about seeding government with science from one end to the other in virtually every federal agency. There's room and need to, to be promoting uh, a scientific core that uh, can help guide policy. But the other lesson here, which may come about, is this issue about how well do we collaborate with other countries? This is, you know, a pandemic, among other things, shows us that uh, we're not little islands separated, uh, you know, by vast oceans without uh, a lot of interaction. In fact, we are one big uh, global society. and. This goes for not only the consequences of a pandemic, which we could see, you know, you're looking at the global map of where, where we are, it's, it's not pretty. And, um, but on the other side of it, if, if we could come out of this with a far greater appreciation of the international agencies that we're supposed to be working with, like World Health Organization, but also just collaborating, scientists collaborating, you know, of the, of the, among the sectors that don't really see international borders very well. It's the science community. And if they're allowed to, to do their thing, I would I, I think we would make incredible advances much more rapidly with a much bigger global uh, impact. So 
but the question is, how do we get this, the scientists that we want to see government with, by the way, have to come from somewhere. And they can't just be, you know, elite, white, you know, well-off uh, families. And it's extremely mm -hmm. important that everybody gets on that bandwagon and that we, the adults, make sure that children aren't left out of the opportunity to aspire, to dream, to see, oh, yeah, I, I could be a scientist working in the Department of Agriculture or you know, any any place in government, I would like to lead, I would like to contribute. Uh, those options, those internal conversations are not had by too many of, uh, too many children, even in, even in the U.S., and the, the data is clear, it's out there. But but I think that's the point I wanted, wanted to, the point I wanted to make earlier. But which the other point is, I want to apologize to Tara, because I, I really do think the, the, the vaccine is an extraordinary development. I'm just so used to being a half empty glass person that my <laughs> reflex is, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, but the yeah, but's sort of uh, overwhelming. I guess I have, to, I have to talk about them every day. But um, yeah, so this is, there's no doubt about it. This was an unbelievable achievement, which I, I didn't think was going to happen. In fact, I, you know, uh, Trump had a, uh, the sort of rollout of the uh, sort of first part of the conclusion of Operation Warp Speed, and he had, he had a videotape to introduce it, where all the naysayers were featured in quick little clips. So I was featured from several months ago when they announced Warp Speed, Operation Warp Speed, and I said another episode of POTUS in Wonderland, and so they apparently disappeared on his introductory tape. But I, I think the point is, yes, phenomenal. And this didn't just happen over the last few years. This has been a work in progress for a very long time. And uh, what an achievement for science in the world. And let's not, I, I don't want to undermine that point. Well, and, and actually I'll, I'll swing back to Tara on that. And and then we're going to go to Roman on the longer time scale questions. Um, what happens in the media now with the vaccine, partially because of Trump's approach to social media is uh, is it, it gets politicized immediately. Trump takes credit for it and we all, or uh, someone says, no, no, no. And we get focused on that granular politics framed part of this. Could you just briefly describe uh, what technological capacities came to play over the last several years that laid the groundwork for that rapid turnaround? One thing that Zainab Tufekki, uh, an amazing writer on this, noted in a recent post, was it also, if we hadn't gotten the full genome essentially leaked almost spontaneously from China by scientists who were then punished terribly uh, in February, that the, this year would have, it would have taken much longer. But so what was the technological picture that made this possible? So in one sentence, the technology um, that's allowing these uh, newer vaccines to work is our increasing ability to read, write, and edit the code of life, the genetic code. There's four ways to make a vaccine right now. The most old fashioned way is to take a whole virus and kill it or disable it so it can't replicate and make you sick and then give it to people so that it turns on your immune system such that the next time you see a live virus, you have a robust immune response. That's where smallpox vaccine came from, for example. <clears throat> um, what we've done um, with um, the Moderna virus and the Pfizer BioNTech virus is we've taken a tiny little piece of genetic code, not from the COVID virus, but a piece of the code that says the same thing as the actual virus code for making the spike protein the receptors on the outside of the virus that stick into your cells and allow the virus to penetrate into your body. We've taken that little piece of genetic code and put it in a lipid bubble so that it can enter your cells. And for a temporary period of time, it instructs your own cells to make this piece of protein from the coronavirus. And that's enough to actually provoke your immune system um, to recognize the virus and to attack it if it were to see a live virus after you get vaccinated. Um, and both Pfizer and Moderna are using that general method. 
The approach used um, by AstraZeneca Oxford is somewhat different. Um, it's again, a little piece of um, nucleic acid that codes for the spike protein, uh, but instead of putting it in a lipid bu bubble, you put it into an engineered cold virus, essentially, engineered to be safe. And that cold virus becomes the ferry that shuttles that little code into your cells and tells them make spike protein. The advantage of these methods is that you can do this very fast. In the old method, you had to grow up tons of the virus in order to kill it so you could turn it into vaccine. And there were many manufacturing problems associated with that process. Um, but uh, these new approaches are much faster um, and are the reason that um, we have a vaccine so quickly. The downside of them is that, as Erwin said, <clears throat> uh, you need to store them at very close cold temperatures. They're expensive, relatively speaking. These RNA, these RNA-based uh, vaccines. The um, the cost is going to be about twenty dollars a dose versus more like three dollars uh, for the AstraZeneca approach. Um, but um, they basically herald a new age in biology when we're able, like I said, to read, write, and, and edit genetic code for our own purposes. Amazing. So are we pretty well situated technologically to respond quickly the next time? We could be. Could be. <laughs> so what's what's the missing factor there? Investment or uh, more capacity? Well, um, investment, certainly. It would have been nice had we already tested these in other platforms. There's many other platforms out there that are being tested. Some are extremely creative and may turn out to be even better than these mRNA vaccines. Um, um, but um, it would have been good had we already done the safety testing for an array of vaccine platforms uh, so we knew their pros and cons and were able to, um, you know, move them into production more quickly. So uh, creating, um, I think, as Eugene said, uh, as um, Erwin said, an international capacity um, to rapidly test and scale up vaccines uh, would be a very good idea. There are people trying to do that. I think CEPI um, is one example. It's a nonprofit entity that's trying to anticipate what vaccines will be needed in the future and get started on making them. Um, I think more attention to what happens after we design a vaccine, how do we rapidly scale it up and how do we distribute it Mm -hmm. Non-glitzy, uninteresting part. Right. Able to vaccinate, I think, needs a lot more attention. And in general, I think we should recognize more, um, more enthusiastically that biology is going to be the technology of the 21st century, and we need to invest in it across a whole litany of areas beyond vaccines. So if I could just emphasize one point here, Andy, about the vaccine. So Tara is completely right and very articulate about, uh, about the science here, and it's really important. The two barriers actually that are most important are not the science part of it. They're the social determinants of actually getting people vaccinated and enough numbers so we get the, you know, the, the uh, sort of golden key of uh, herd immunity. But secondly, the, or at least the, the barriers here that I'm, I'm foreseeing are the two, one that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, the issue of vaccine resistance. This is not a minor problem. We have somewhere in the vicinity of 50% of Americans who are going to be very skeptical and may resist taking vaccines. And even if they, even if all 50% did, they're only 90%, let's say, effective, let's call it that. Uh, we're still going to have plenty of unvaccinated people. And the task of communications, which is really what this is about, you know, so we did the science. Now we have to communicate to people to have them get over this nonsense about vaccine resistance and the incredible misinformation that comes across in social media. It is a very powerful uh, problem that is a barrier. And this, the other one, though, is the actual distribution of the vaccine to communities that need them. 
We have 65 million Americans li live in what the federal government designates as health professional shortage areas, HIPSAs, where you have very low ratios of doctors to population, let's say, very limited amount of clinics, and real problem with people getting even routine care, not to mention two doses of a vaccine that requires sort of extreme uh, cold uh, to sustain them. It's so there, there are, these are delivery problems which are layered on long-standing problems in the, uh, the U.S.'s healthcare delivery system uh, that in addition to the vaccine resistance is going to make a really big difference. So if it's the best vaccine in the world, but it's getting to only 30 or 35 percent of the population, that's where the problem is going to lie in my, in my mind. And of course, that's, that's a part of the population that if you look uh, racially or in other ways, is most likely has a higher percentage of people who are vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable. So I just want to throw in that, that you know, taking a, abstracting from what Aaron and Tara are saying, one of the really, there are two, two important points here. One is Erwin's point about us being interdependent and cooperative. But the, but the biggest one I think is, this is really an example of what we can do when human beings take their creativity and their intelligence and apply it to a problem. And it's, it, it is a remarkable achievement. What we're looking at, and I think this, this does apply very much to Roman's thinking, is what if we applied that kind of creativity to the other problems that we have? What if we applied, if we applied that kind of urgency and creativity to social problems in, in the one that Erwin was, was related to? Then we have the capacity as human beings to do remarkable things. Um, you know, and then the question is, can we find a way to do them? Yeah. I, um... On the climate front, I recently um, held a conversation here about innovation. And, you know, since 2006, I've been writing stories for the New York Times and then later on the in unbelievable underinvestment we have made in basic energy sciences, energy R&D, and innovation stimulation. And there was a new call for it. But then I had a guy on who's a, in Norway who's a social scientist who described the deeper gap in R&D and basic science in the social and behavioral sciences as they relate to climate and energy. It's like, and he, they had just published a paper. It was, it's like 0.12% of all research was, is social, in a, uh, social behavioral science related to energy. And it's, it's a tiny fraction of energy research. The same thing, you know, public health has been at this a long, longer time than energy and climate, meaning uh, behavior change or, how is it that people misinform are misinformed? How can you better inform them? It's been decades in the public health arena, and it still feels like a grand challenge. Partially related to what we said earlier about communitarianism, and that gets back to even deeper layers of scholarship uh, and social science on what makes you who you are culturally. Mm -hmm. Can I just chip in there, Andy? Just yeah, of course. You know, made me think there about you know, Jonas Salk's famous question attributed to him of, you know, are we being good ancestors? And, you know, we can ask ourselves, okay, if we, if we want to be good ancestors, how can we harness, say, the powers of technologies in these multiple spheres? You know, okay, there's public health, but there are all these other areas. I mean, if you think about, you know, consumption, the technologies of consumption, okay, there's a buy now button. Well, I'd love to invent. In fact, I gave a talk at Google the, the other day. I said, why don't you invent, why doesn't somebody invent the buy later button instead of the buy now button? You know, and you click the button to buy now and there's a drop down menu and you've got options. Yeah, you can buy now or you can buy in a week or buy in a month or buy in a year or borrow from a friend. You might get an, e if you press buy in a year, in a year's time, you get an email saying, do you really need that third yo yoga mat? If you want, you can buy it now. Well, I was kind of half joking, but actually the next day, um, someone wrote to me and said, oh, I heard you say that. So I've just, um, I'm starting up a new, uh, website designing an, an app called mindfulcart.com uh, to try and, you know, I, I mean, the website exists now, but the technology is still being developed to, I guess, find a way of hacking into that consumer tech culture. I mean, and that's just right. one example. Where, why are we not innovating with all these kinds of platforms around some of these other big long-term questions of being good ancestors around consumption? And we do see innovation in other technologies too, like you know, Stanford has something called, I think it's called the Virtual Human Interactions Lab, where you can have an experience of what it's like to watch a coral reef uh, bleach 
over the next hundred years. Um, so you can kind of swim around, as it were, in a virtual uh, right. reality setting. But once those technologies really start becoming cheap and better quality, um, then there's a whole way of catapulting ourselves into a range of future scenarios around climate and many other things. It's, it feels like an opportunity, although the monetization question there is interesting too. Who, uh, I, I think there's a subset of us who would embrace a, an app that has a violator button, <laughs> but uh, we're still so stuck in our, the folks who are working in Silicon Valley. Uh, there are some who are working for the public good, obviously, but many still are just there for the clicks and the, and the success of monetarily, monetary focused success. So there's, there's big challenges there. Uh, I want to show one last graphic from from uh, Roman's site, and I think this is in the book too. Hold on one second. We'll close out with the, the big scale picture. And I guess this is the tug of war of time for time. This is the the ancestor part. In other words, what are we doing now? That's about now versus uh, where we go from here. Deep time humility. I love that idea. We don't know a lot of stuff, and you have a whole list here of these um, questions that still are powerful ones about inter intergenerational justice. I did a, a piece 10 years ago with a lawyer on whether the future needs a legal guardian. <laughs> that, she's, she's, I got to get her on this show. Um, cathedral thinking, you know, building a cathedral was implicitly a task of generations. And what are we doing with our security and sustainability questions that has the, that architecture? Of course, it's interesting too, Tara would know this because it's like building a cathedral where you start building with brick and then you realize you're building with tungsten steel and then you're building with some new polymer. So it's sort of evolving even in its technology as it's being built, having it be flexible and, and monumental at the same time. These are great, great questions. I hope you've all appreciated your time in this conversation today. And if you have any last thoughts, this is a time for that. And maybe we'll just start with uh, Tara, you know, and the tug, the, the tug of war over technology and uh, in the ethical frame and in the practical frame. Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, the future is likely to come into focus and be pursued more avidly to the extent that we can make it hopeful. I think people are motivated um, by hopefulness and by positive emotions. I regret about about climate is that they are so depressing, I can barely tolerate them, although I'm convinced they're correct. So I find the vaccines in response to COVID very hopeful, and I hope others will too and inject that note of optimism and can doism into the fight against COVID in coming days. And I agree with you on that, having a vision. We have this meeting coming up at Columbia next year on managed retreat. It's really about the part of climate change that we can't prevent. And how do you build a, to me, it's all about building a culture, including among students, of uh, energetically diving into the question. How do yeah. we shape an adaptive future? How, yeah. how do we shape a community that can be resilient and creative and thriving, even with what we know is coming? So thank you, Tara, for being here today. I know we all, some of you have to jump off. So uh, I'd love to have you back sometime. We can, we can review the bidding, see how things are going. And uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And feel free to pop off if you need to. And okay. Roman, uh, your work is really inspirational to me. It gets at some of these questions I've been digging at for a while in less coherent ways. And uh, I'd love to have you and Kate on at the same time. We'll figure out how to do that. And Jonathan Salk, again, the work you've done you're on your own, the work you did with your father is inspirational. And that curve, which I should try to show one more time before we um, break, is um, I think it's essential for people to understand that not everything that goes like this results in a crash and burn enterprise, that you can have transitions. And that's part of how nature has tends to operate often. Erwin, again, great to have you on. And the focus on kids particularly their future is a big chunk of what Roman's future is about. So taking care of today's kids is part of being a good ancestor. So thank you for being here too. There's one, one last thing I'm gonna note is that today Columbia really formally launched a, a climate school. 
Huh. This is a, and what I really like about this is it's not a climate change school, meaning it's not a school of climate science. It's about the climate question. And we're, they're building the curriculum around uh, the, the interdisciplinary realities of the climate question. How do you uh, decarbonize a world that's 80% carbon still after 40 years of concerns? How do you build resilience in communities? A big focus is going to be on equity and justice. The, the vision includes um, that from the start, um, education, culture, and inclusion, impact, and solutions. And uh, I'm going to be helping to create the sort of communication architecture that can make this all function both internally and externally. So it's exciting to be in a place that's um, got that kind of approach to these grand challenges to sculpt the way we teach and the way we uh, relate to the world in, in, uh, with that approach. So it's great. Thanks all for being here today. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Stay well, stay safe, Bye. hug everyone in your bubble, <laughs> and connect with those outside the bubble, including culturally. I'll, st you know, what? I'm gonna give me one last second if you can. I want to show one last thing if I can, which is the Darwin. Hold on. You know what? We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to show that Darwin quote. It's really powerful about where That's we're really poised. Funny. Technology can actually help connect and build the landscape that can generate more empathy, can, can generate more understanding of how the future matters today. And so we'll get to that more. Thank you.